almost feels like a Halloween passage. <laughs> Please pray with me. May these words that I speak be grounded in my soul, encouraged by the God presence in me. And may these words that you hear be captured by your soul, enlivened by the God presence in you. Amen. Knowledge. Knowledge has dramatically changed our understanding of the nature of God and the world we live in. We know the earth is not flat. We know the sun does not revolve around the earth. We know that heaven and hell are not separate realms above and below this flat earth. We know that God is not an old guy in the sky. And many of us no longer believe that God determines the events of our lives or decides when and how we will die. And I believe the time is close when this last statement will become the understanding of the majority. It is Religion, it is religion that has held us captive to this way of understanding God. But it is losing its power with each passing generation. This season of creation began with the Genesis story of creation. A story that began as part of our ancestors' oral tradition and was eventually written down. It was told and created based on the limited knowledge they had of the universe. But it was a way to attempt to capture the wonder of God and the miracle of creation. And it was believed when all of the statements I opened with were also believed to be true. And although it is still a great story, it no longer tells the truth of the beginning of an evolutionary universe. The knowledge we possess now calls us to look more deeply into the nature of God. And I believe that our knowledge and wisdom is by necessity moving us away from a life of holding on to ancient beliefs and religious doctrines that re would require us to set our knowledge aside. Kind of leave it at the front door. Rather, we are being called into a dynamic, moving, changing, transforming way of believing that acknowledges the faith journeys of our ancestors and gives us the necessary freedom to create a living faith for our own time. And I am not saying that the biblical story isn't important. It is vitally important. It is vitally important as a guide for our life in God. It is the history of our faith journey. But we are not the same people with the same knowledge and the same understanding as people thousands of years ago. And future generations will not be the same as us. That is the very nature of evolution. That is the very nature of the universe. That, I believe, is the very nature of God. This call away from, believing, from a life of believing in a set of doctrines into a life of faith that is moving, changing, transforming, is what I believe the Gospel reading this morning is about. Jesus is speaking in the synagogue in Capernaum. He is delivering a homily, reflecting on the prescribed Torah reading of the day. We know this because he refers, as John said, he refers to the manna in the desert, which is best known from the Exodus story where Moses asks God to feed the people. But Jesus 
takes this opportunity to once again turn their understanding upside down. Jesus was living in a time when the religious system was used to keep people obedient in fear of God. And the system was more concerned with dogma and rules than for the spiritual well-being of its people. Religion demanded unquestioning loyalty. Religion was life-taking rather than life-giving. And Jesus recognized this. And frankly, in many places, that hasn't changed. He witnessed a society that had lost connection to God because their belief system got in the way. Jesus' intention was not to create a new religion. <clears throat> Far from it. He wanted to break the people free from religion in favor of a personal and communal relationship with God, where they were deeply and intimately connected to God and to each other. It is this intention that gives the context for this reading. The entire homily is metaphor, and in some ways a riddle, as Jesus challenges the faithful to open up and examine their spiritual lives. It's very important to remember that John's Gospel, written at least a hundred years after Jesus' death, was written almost entirely in metaphor. And so it is unlikely that Jesus actually said these words or delivered this homily. But that doesn't matter. Because it is still an authentic reflection of the Gospel writer's understanding of Jesus. And so we continue with this story. Jesus calls himself the bread of life, and that whoever eats this bread will live forever. Jesus says that their ancestors ate manna in the desert, and they died. It is impossible to understand this message here if the whole thing is not read metaphorically. If we accept that bread of life is a metaphor for Jesus, if we accept that eating his flesh and drinking his blood is metaphor, and I sure hope we do, then we must also see the manna in the desert and dying and living forever as metaphor. I believe that Jesus is using manna as a metaphor for their religion, their system of beliefs, which brought spiritual death because it did not bring them into a personal and communal relationship with God. The bread of life is metaphor for the authentic, moving, changing, transforming way to God. Jesus was calling them away from religious obedience into the life-giving wonder of the Spirit of God that was already in them. Jesus offered this, I believe, because he personally experienced God deeply, profoundly, and completely outside of the religion in which he was raised. The challenge of discipleship is that, like Jesus, we have to step out of the comfort, or straitjacket, depending on how you experience it, of our belief system into the uncertainty of a continually evolving spiritual life. The challenge of discipleship is to grow our souls with wonder, with compassion, and deeply, deeply authentic love. This is what it is to eat the flesh and drink the blood of Jesus. He was not calling us to worship him. He was not calling us to idolize him. He was calling us 
to be like him, to live like him, and to live completely in God. Jesus had come to a different understanding, a different knowledge, a different wisdom about his religion and the sacred text, and participated in the evolutionary nature of the universe by transforming and reinterpreting the story. I believe it is our responsibility as disciples to do exactly the same in our time. Yesterday, 33 of us gathered at Okanagan Center Hall for our congregational retreat. It was a very rich day. I know that because I felt the heaviness, the tiredness from the incredible amount of energy as I, I left there yesterday. It was a very rich day as we shared personal stories with laughter and tears. As we talked about what we value in this church community. As we named the many challenges that we face. And as we imagined what authentic, dynamic, transforming Christian community might look like. I wish you could have all been there. What I experienced was a deep, resonating love for each other and for this community, and a yearning for even deeper connection. That, my friends, is what the bread of life is all about. Walking that path towards intimate, personal relationship with God, in communion with fellow travelers who love and support one another, is is what it means to eat his flesh and drink his blood. This is the way of the kingdom of God, at least for now, in this ever-evolving universe. We now know that the earth is round, sort of. We now know that the earth revolves around the sun in an infinite and ever-expanding universe. We now know that our conception of heaven and hell is ever-changing. Many of us have seen our understanding of the nature of God change and continue to evolve. Just as Jesus confronted the belief system that he lived in and questioned his beliefs, in order to bring meaning and purpose to life, so must we in our time. That may sound odd coming from an employee of the institution. However, it was Betty Marlin, when I was doing my Adjacal ministry training, that said to all of us, your job is to work yourself out of a job. choir this morning sang the song Walk by Faith. The men and women in this song are faith-filled people. Faith-filled people who took up the challenge of discipleship in their lives, in their time. And so must we, in our time and in our way. As we bring our season of creation to a close, at least for now, we return to the creation of the universe. But this time, it is not the Genesis story. Rather, it is a story still firmly rooted in the power and wonder of God, but with the addition of our current knowledge of the beginning of our amazing universe. And it's still not the whole truth. Our children will tell this new story of our faith as part of our worship today. I believe it is essential for us and for every generation 
to continue to evolve our faith stories, if there is any hope for our religion to be life-giving. I also believe that this is what Jesus would expect us to do in the challenge of discipleship.